Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel. If you're watching on YouTube, please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or we post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. All right, let's open our Bibles tonight. Revelation chapter 16, verse 1, uh, one as we continue on our slow crawl through this book. And we are getting near the end. If you haven't been with us, all of these studies are on the archives online. They are also available in the bookstore, as well as all of the outlines for all of those studies. I think this is, I don't know, we're at like study number, I don't know what it is. It's a lot. What is it? 31. There I go, 31. Um, but they're available to you. I, I can't go over all of it every week. I'm not going to do so tonight. We're having communion as well. But suffice it to say, we are towards the end of the Great Tribulation. Uh, in chapter 14, if you were with us, the Lord spoke to us about how glorious his long-suffering had been. And even to the bitter end, the extremes that God will go to be sure that every heart hears the good news of his Son. I mean, it is God's greatest desire that you would be saved. It is the, the, the single most important thing we can talk about. By chapter 15, however, that end for man is near. And this pouring out of God's judgment, this wrath of God, is now ready to be poured out. In fact, we read in chapter 15, verse 1, that then these last seven plagues will complete the judgment or the wrath of the Lord upon unbelieving man. By the time this preparation, as we get to these last seven judgments, goes forth, God has isolated himself in the temple, in heaven. Put everyone out. His, his throne is closed for access. And very somberly and, and with great isolation, the Lord sends forward these angels to judge. It's not God's heart to judge the wicked. He wants to save us. The Bible says that he is not and cannot rejoice in the death of the wicked. He does rejoice in the death of his saints. We have a couple of funerals here the next couple of Fridays, dear saints from the church. All of heaven rejoices in their arrival because for them, Jesus came. But by the time we get to the end of this chapter, in fact, if, we, if you look at verse 17, You'll read the seventh angel pouring out his bowl into the air and proclaiming as a loud voice from the temple, from the Lord himself, proclaims, it is done, it is finished. We're going to spend tonight down through verse 9. Next week we will finish this, this chapter or this chapter on wrath. There will be two chapters in the middle where we are given by the Lord insights into God's heart towards man's religion, which now finds itself unable to deliver and from man's commercialism, his commerce, and the desire to just, that you know, the world is driven by gain, and yet that all comes falling down as well. All of them uh, uh, characterized under the ministry, or ministry, the, the example of Babylon, if you will, uh, in history. So two chapters here, I should say two weeks here, two chapters, and then we'll get to chapter 19, which is, I think, what we've all been waiting for the Lord to return. Though God in his love has waited so long and reached out continuously to man, this chapter is different. Judgment comes with no alternative, no hope, no offer of salvation, no, uh, you know, interrupted, I should say, judgment from God. It is unavoidable. Most of those that are left upon the earth have taken the mark of the beast have found their future to be sealed and will now face the judgment of God. Imagine what Jesus went through to give us life. I mean, we're having communion tonight. Always brings that to mind. The abandonment that Jesus faced on the cross from his father. My God, why have you forsaken me? The lonely road that he walked, that he alone understood from day one why he had come. The ultimate sacrifice he made. And then if you read Genesis 22, the sacrifice of the Father in sending his only begotten Son as he sent him for our sins. God's constraint 
can just imagine the angels offering to just come and destroy everyone that touched Jesus, his patience, his love. Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, said in chapter 1, the Jews are seeking a sign and the Greeks are seeking after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which to the Jews is a stumbling block, which to the, uh, to the Greeks is foolishness. But to those who are called both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and he is the wisdom of God. For the Jews, the cross was a stumbling block because their anticipation was a Messiah that would take over. Take over now. <laughs> Loose our chains, you know, take over the world, put us out where we belong. And anything that fell short of that kept them from really believing and, and embracing that which God had come to do, though the scriptures that they bore certainly pointed to him as the one they had been waiting for. They wanted a ruler. And when he died, their hopes were dashed. Though, like I said, his work, his witness, certainly his resurrection testified that he was the one. To the Gentiles, the cross was simply foolishness. It didn't compute. In their minds, their understanding, it didn't, it didn't come together. How could one man on the cross possibly bring salvation to me? And the, the idea violated their, their scholarship, their reason. Is that really the way things should work out? Yet Paul said, for those who believe in God, the cross is both God's power and his wisdom set upon display. If nothing else, the cross is God's statement that there's only one way in. This isn't just door number one. <laughs> this isn't just one alternative. It is the way to life paved by him. The problem is for many people, the cross becomes very restrictive. It's too narrow. It's too limiting. The message which is unflattering to the flesh, you're a sinner, you're going to hell, you need a savior, is set aside because people, man in general, wants to play a bigger part in his own salvation. All I have to do is believe in the Lord. It doesn't seem like I'm getting a lot of credit. So man wants to broaden the way. He wants to just simply do his best and follow that mantra that all roads lead to God. And the most important thing is sincerity. Not truth, not doctrine, not faith, not the infallibility of God's promises, but I, I did the best I could. How can you say Christianity is the only way? And the answer is because that's what the Bible says. In the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus faced the inevitability of his sacrifice, Matthew tells us in chapter 26 that the Lord labored for hours in prayer, fought with his whole concept of, of the substitutionary death that he would have to face. Three different times, verse 39, verse 30, 42, verse 44, he said to his father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, if there's any other way. Yet, Father, your will be done. And if this cup cannot be taken from me, your will be done. But if man could be better, if man could accomplish more, if there was a, way, a better way, a more religious way, if I could avoid the cross and the separation that I would have to face with you for their benefit, then let's do that. And heaven's answer was pretty clear. There was no other way. The angels came to minister to the Son. We're so close now. And each time he, he prayed, sweating great drops of blood and anguish, and used the word nevertheless. God longed to redeem men. He made you, then he wants to save you. And he offered to do that at, at the cross of his Son, and then says it is absolutely the only way your sins can be forgiven. It's the only way God can forgive your sins and remain just. Because he'd already declared the judgment of sin would be death. He can't change the rules midstream because they don't work out for him. He, he's, he's holy and righteous. <laughs> he's good, but holy. And Jesus suffered the agony and the shame of our transgressions, but in the in the process, he declares in no uncertain terms, this is the only way you can go. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's very narrow indeed, and, and it is because God has provided a way that he could righteously 
save man. On the other hand, the cross puts on display the horrible destiny of anyone who decides to just go it alone. I don't need Jesus. Okay. <laughs> this is what you can expect then to face. The horror is so great that God sent his only son to spare you from it. Hell is so, is so horrifying that he says to you, it isn't made for you. It's made for the devil and his angels. You don't have to go there. At the cross, Jesus took the wrath of God who was righteous. But it is the same wrath that you read in this chapter. It's the wrath of God against rebellion and sin. He took it for those who would look to him. And to those who will not, they'll face it themselves. God is angry at sin. He sees how it destroys lives. You see it in the world around you. Everything it touches, it, it, it destroys. If tonight you are living in sin and have no relationship with God, it's destroying you. You can cover it up in a hundred ways. Put a bigger band-aid on the problem. But his anger is that sin, and ultimately his anger will be against those who refuse his love, who decide, you know, they don't need him. He died in vain. Jesus, or I should say, the Father in his righteousness has declared that sin must be punishable by death, which is why he came. In sin, we have no hope. There was no hope when we were in sin. The wages of sin is death, but God came to bring us a a reward, a, a gift to those who would trust in him. His anger against sin was nailed to a tree. So complete is his work that Paul will say to the Romans, much more than having been justified by his blood, we are saved from his wrath through him. Here's his wrath, and you're in heaven. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. Same chapter, same verse. God hasn't appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through his Son. So, when it comes to the tribulation time, for anyone to think that, that a Christian would have to stand here and face the wrath of God does not clearly understand the Bible or the effectiveness and the sufficiency of the cross. The Lord has delivered you from his wrath. God's judgment was fully satisfied at Calvary. We're having communion to declare that. It's taken care of. Nothing needs to be offered beyond what's been offered for us. And the people you're going to meet in this chapter have decided they don't need him. And at some point, you just run out of room. And God says that's enough. There's nothing left for you to do but to trust in his son. Nothing you can add, nothing you can accomplish that will complete the work. The work is done for you. There is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So, we've been delivered from his wrath, back to chapter 4, verse 1, but here in the end of the great tribulation, God pours out his wrath and in great sadness and sorrow, I am sure, but with tremendous certainty, this final judgment falls before he returns. And like I said, this chapter leads directly to chapter 19. Those chapters in the middle are those parenthetical ones where you're stopped and asked to consider some other things. But timeline-wise, one leads directly to the other. So you want to be sure you have Jesus as your hope as your, as your uh, anchor. Hang on to him. He'll get you there. Because all that you face in the world is far little and very uh, non-consequential compared to what eternity will be like. Verse 1, chapter 16 says this, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go! pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. And so the first one went, and he poured out his bowl upon the earth, 
and a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped the image. Back in chapter 15, as we began in verse 1, I think, to read that when these seven plagues were accomplished, the, the wrath of God would be completed. We were shown in verse 2 those who had gone through the fire of, of, of life under this Antichrist and under his, his minions, if you will, and ended up losing their lives for the sake of their faith in Christ. And, and they find themselves gathered together before the Lord, having victory over the mark of the beast and the number of his name. Well, these in chapter 16 have not. These guys have decided otherwise. I'm going to throw in with the world. I'm going to throw in with the ways of the world. I'm going to throw in with the beast and all of his power. And like I said, all of this judgment comes forth from the privacy of God's temple where he has removed himself from everyone else during this grievous but righteous time as he speaks. Complete judgments will lead to the return of Christ. And like I said, John has a couple more visions in the middle for us to look at. But I think if you look at verse 2, and, and for that matter, if you've been with us for a while, there is a tremendous hardness, hardness that sin brings into a person's life. I can't imagine all that these folks have seen and experienced the last few years, and yet somehow they have decided they can go it alone. Up to this point, even with the trumpet judgments, there was always a partial loss of things to instill hope that it could be restored. There was always, there was a, um, you know, there was, there was always a door open for repentance. But, but at least in this chapter, the judgments and the bulls are, completely and, and totally punitive. In other words, they've passed the point of no return. This is it. It's a horrible chapter, but one that we should take note of. So John, in verse 1, hears a loud voice. By the way, if you've been paying attention, John has heard a loud voice 20 different times. I don't know if everybody's just screaming in heaven, heaven or what. But to John, it was, it was, you know, and this is obviously the Lord's, Lord speaking from the temple It'll be his voice in verse 17 that says it is finished. But here the order given by the Lord in his solitude, it's time. It's time. These bowls that were filled with God's wrath are being poured out. That little phrase, poured out, you'll find it a lot in the Old Testament, in the New Testament as well, as the Lord begins to just judge the people. You'll read in Psalm, for example, 79, How long, Lord, will you hold your anger forever? Pour out your wrath upon the nations that do not know you and the kingdoms that will not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid his dwelling place. To, he has destroyed, if you will, his dwelling place. But pour out. God, it is, it is that, that imagery that you see uh, constantly used. When we look at the seven years a prophecy of, of these final seven years in Daniel chapter 9, it, it speaks about the abomination that will be taking place. And, so, and then it says, until God's judgment is poured out upon the desolate. Until God says, this is enough. Well, here it is. This is enough. These bulls' judgments have a lot in common with the trumpet judgments. They're not all the same, but they, they tend to differ specifically in intensity and in timing, one comes right on top of the other. I think, for example, if you lose water to drink, you know this isn't lasting long, and that will be one of them as well. But they mirror much of what God did in judging Pharaoh and Egypt and not letting his people go. There's a lot to be said for laying as Exodus next to the book of Revelation in, in terms of how God works. So the first bull, verse 2 loathsome's sores, an oozing, discharging ulcer that appears on those who have taken the mark of the beast and bowed their knee to the image that he made, a running sore that won't heal. If you read ahead to verse 11 where the, sixth, uh, sorry, the fifth bull is poured out upon these afflicted, they are still suffering the, the physical affliction of this first seal. So this appears to be something that certainly doesn't go away, and it is found in the lives of those who have kneed down to the dragon, the, drag the beast, the, the false 
prophet. And, and we will read as we go that they continued, verse 9, to blaspheme God. Nothing can bring them to the end of themselves, and that's really what is left. <laughs> People that are not willing to turn. You say to yourself, who's left then to go into the kingdom? Good question. The Jews that God has been hiding in Petra certainly will enter into the kingdom age, just as the Lord had brought um, some of Israel's, you know, the contingency through in the days of his wrath in Egypt. Anyone who has survived without taking the mark, wherever they might be, and I guess you could probably do that around the world, but there's going to be fewer people than you think getting to the time where in Jesus' return we find those who are ready to stand before him and enter the kingdom that he's going to rule in. There may be some countries that fight against the Antichrist and stand their ground. We don't know. God doesn't tell us. You can just conjecture. and that. So, <laughs> conjecture, anybody's guess, I guess. And we don't really want to go with that. Uh, these boils, if you will, or these sores that we read remind us of the sixth seal, uh, sorry, the sixth plague that God brought upon Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, I think it's in Exodus chapter 9. Um, when the Lord later brought the children of Israel into the land, he had the, the priests stand, some upon one mountain, some upon the other as they entered. And one of the things the Lord said to the people is, if you obey me, I will keep from you all of the plagues that Egypt faced. But if you turn your back on me, if you decide to go alone, I, I will allow all of the plagues upon Egypt to fall upon you. And those um, who here are, had chosen to bear the mark of the beast will now be merit wearing the mark of God's wrath. He's got the mark of the beast, yeah, and he's got boils. You know, he's got sores. He's, he's marked all right. God had already warned that taking the mark of the beast or bowing your knee to its image was irreversible, eternally damning. Chapter 14, I think verse 9, 10, and 11 and now this first bowl brings suffering to nearly everyone upon the earth. It's a visible, constant, obvious pain that will not go away. They will die in that pain facing God. There's been a lot of explanation. I shouldn't say explanation. Um, in, in, uh, there's been a lot of speculation. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, by a lot of Bible scholars as to what the cause of these boils might be. And if you go to read Revelation commentaries, especially if they've been written um, in a modern era, they, they will try to explain them about radioactive fallout or you know, the, the result of a nuclear war. They'll port to Hiroshima or Nagasaki where many suffered in like manner because of the radioactivity. And that's fine if you want to try to figure out a natural cause for what God is doing. Uh, if you go to the book of Exodus and you read the same thing, there isn't one of these scholars that will say, eh, it's probably nuclear fallout, it's, it's a nuclear bomb, just look at Hiroshima, because they didn't exist. And somehow God could still accomplish it. So that's good enough for me. I like when you speculate, yeah, up to you, but I'll only give you what I know the Bible says. It says, it says this is going to happen and God's going to do it. It's coming right from his throne. It's in the hand of an angel. It's at the very end of the great tribulation when there is no more hope for those that are left, they've decided to go elsewhere. So I, I really don't need an explanation as to how. I'm, I'm comfortable just knowing uh, why and who. And it's a time of tremendous distress. And notice there's no repentance. It's out of the question. It, it is mind-boggling to me that an earth would be filled with people like this. Um, but, but God has not lied to us yet. Verse 3 tells us the second bull, the second angel goes forth out of uh, and pours out his bowl upon the sea, and it becomes blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea dies. This bull follows hard on the, on the heels of the first. This time, the judgment is poured out upon the sea. Blood as a dead man, coagulated, unable to carry life to the tissues, remove waste from the body, dried kind of blood. Imagine a, a, an ocean like that around the world where every living creature in it dies. Now back in Exodus, as God brought judgment upon Pharaoh, who 
who held his people, a, a type of the world. Moses, in the first of the ten plagues, turned the Nile River into blood. Earlier in our study here in Revelation, in the, the sounding of the, the second trumpet, a third of the ocean was affected when a molten star hit it and a third of the creatures in it died. Well, this is the rest. This, this second bull brings each, you know, every, universal, I should say, impact. Now this circle of death en encompasses the globe. Imagine the beaches, the stench, the bacteria, the loss of food, especially if you live in a nation that looks to the sea for its substance. The end is in sight. Every kind of uh, essential life supporting system is being removed by the Lord. Judgment is poured out. This is it. And it's horrifying. Verse 4, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and upon the springs of water. They also became blood. And I heard the angel of the, of the waters declaring, You're righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things and they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. Now you've given them blood to drink. It is their just due. If it wasn't enough to touch the oceans, now the third bull hits all the fresh water, the lakes, the streams, uh, the rivers, the fountains of water. And all of the drinking water upon the earth now meets the wrath of the king of kings. I don't know how long you survive without water. And I can't just imagine the, the war, at least for a few days, that will be fought over stored water. You know, you don't want to own a 7-Eleven now. They'll all come running for the water. We just know it's going to be short, right? This, is, this tells you how short this period is going to be. Again, during the trumpet's judgments, a third of the, the drinking water was left by the Lord's hand, undrinkable and bitter. But now all potable water is affected. Jesus' first miracle, he turned water into wine in celebration. The ordinary for the extraordinary. You will hear the awesome work of God will let everyone know that the world has chosen a direction, that they, they've chosen to follow a liar. But it'll be too late. As these things are taking place, John hears some very interesting declarations. First, notice in verse 5, from the angel of the waters... I like the title. It's, it's not really used elsewhere in the scriptures. I, I couldn't tell you this is the same angel that poured out the third bull, for he, he seems to be designated as a different angel. Angels sure have lots of jobs in the Bible. In, back in chapter 7, we, we met some angels that, that their whole job was to hold back the winds from the four corners of the earth until the Lord said, let them go. So here you are for, for years waiting. Others are seen as uh, guarding the abuso. Others are delivering messages. Some are watching over the saints as guardians. Some are in the heavens singing God's praises. A few that we saw last time, last time were flying through the heavens with warnings and a message of the salvation God would bring. And here's an angel who seems to be in charge of the water. Culligan man in heaven. You know, it could be that the world sometimes calls the forces of nature or nothing, nothing other than the hand of God at works through his servant, the angels. This angel, on the heels of what is going on on the earth, simply declares that God's judgment is right. That God is right in what he's doing. That they had spilled the blood of the saints and the prophets over the generations, but now they would be forced to drink blood, so to speak. The bloodshed during the tribulation is unparalleled in history. From chapter 7 forward, the, the number of saints coming to the Lord is, is uncountable, the Bible says. I mean, there's no way to even add them up. There will be so many having to give their life. And so the angel declares that the punishment fits the crime. This is poetic justice. This is right. And he declares loudly and defends God's honor, lest anyone question his ways. By the way, this is how God often works in the Bible. You know, Pharaoh set out to drown the new, newborn Hebrew children. Instead, God turns around and drowns his entire army. Haman 
builds a gallows with, with a plan and a hope to hang Mordecai upon them and exterminate the Jews, God makes sure that Haman gets hung on the gallows that he built. Saul refuses God's direction to wipe out the Amalekites. And so he spares some, and years later he's mortally wounded by an Amalekite. Reap what you sow. Want that kind of life? You get, you get that kind of life. You have shed the blood of my saints. There, there's a, a scripture in chapter 17, I think it's verse, let me see, verse 6, where, where John writes, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Well, now try this on for size. Isaiah chapter 49, Isaiah prophesied, I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine, and all flesh will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer. I am alone the mighty one of Jacob. Well, here he is, <laughs> the mighty one of Jacob declaring who he is. So chiming in with this water or angel of the water is another angel from another area around the altar and in heaven. Notice verse 7, I heard another from the altar, another angel, saying, even so, which by the way is the word amen, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. This time that God had had prolonged his mercy for so many generations, he, can re he will prolong it no other. But even so, God, this is right. It's a good thing tonight that God hasn't given this room what we deserve. Amen. <laughs> I'm so glad. Sometimes I wish that on my enemies. Give them what they deserve, Lord. But never upon myself, nor upon you. Maybe this is the angel that stood before the, the altar of incense representing the prayers of the saints because there had been a lot of prayers coming from this group saying, Lord, how long before you, you justify us, before you, you, know, you pay them back, before you, you bring judgment to bear, and how, will, how long before you avenge our blood and God is doing that? I know there are a lot of people that question the goodness of God or the fairness of God on this side of the grave, I guarantee you there's none on the other side who are questioning his goodness. All the angels are in harmony with God's choices and God's decisions. They call him just and righteous. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways. Gracious is his words. Righteous are you, O Lord, in all of your judgments. It would be wise to consider that tonight God feels the same way about sin as you read here. He hates it. Hates it in your life. Hates what it will do to you. The good news is we're living in this age of mercy and grace that still constrains God's judgment. But eventually, in chapter 16, it comes out. How patient is the Lord? Well, look around. When Abraham had that discussion with, with the Lord back in chapter 18 of Genesis, and, and he began to question the judgment of Upon Sodom and on, he said, Lord, it's not like you to destroy the righteous with the wicked. And Far be it from you. You're, you're the judge of all of the earth. You're going to do the right thing. Lord, don't be angry with me. How, how many would it take to, to, to turn your judgment? And he said, for, the, for ten righteous, would you, would you hold back? And he said, for ten righteous, I would, I'd spare the place. That ought to tell you what's going on on the earth now. There aren't ten righteous. The judgment is falling. Verse 8, and then the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who had power over these plagues, but they did not repent or give him glory. The very fact that the sun rises and sets consistently to bring heat and cool and and comfort is a blessing that most of us take for granted. Unless you're Annie. Think about it, you'll be all right. The sun will come out. Okay. 
trying to lighten up the mood there a little bit. Sorry, Gerard. Now the, the son becomes man's enemy. What had been a blessing from God now turns against them as they you know, seek to use his blessings, if you will, to their advantage, but they lose it. When, when, when Luke wrote uh, Jesus' um, conversations with the disciples about the last days, he, he wrote, recorded the Lord saying, there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars upon the earth, distress of late nations, great perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts will fail, and the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then the Lord will come. So, true to form, the son that had blessed so many for so long would now become his enemy as the goodness of God that they had been granted faithfully is removed from them. Here's what Isaiah wrote about this time, a very prophetic, powerful verses. Chapter 24, he wrote this, Behold, the Lord will make the earth empty and wasteful, distorting its surface, scattering its inhabitants, and it will be as the people, so the priest, as the servant, so the master, as the maid, so the mistress, as the buyer, so the sellers, as the lender, so the borrower, and the creditor, so the debtor. The land shall be entirely empty and utterly plundered. For the Lord has spoken his word, and the earth will mourn and fade away. The world will languish, fading away. The people of the earth will languish. The earth will be defiled under its inhabitants. They've transgressed the law, changed the organisms, ordinances, broken God's everlasting covenant, therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who are left on it are desolate, and they will be burned, and few men will be left. Pretty powerful. 700 B.C. points to this verse and God's promise to fulfill it. In the fourth trumpet judgment, judgment chapter 8, I think, the sun had lost a third of its light. In fact, everything had it had dimmed, if you will, but here um, everything is completely reversed. When, when Jesus hung at Calvary for those last three hours from noon to three o'clock, the earth was darkened. The sun wouldn't give its light. It, it was like all of creation mourned his death, but here the, the Lord sets the temperature to broil. The word scorch is a word that means to severely burn. And remember, there's no drinking water. It re reminds me of the request of the rich man in hell there in Luke 16, where he said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus. Let him dip his finger in the water so he can cool my tongue. I'm in tormented in this flame. And, and he was told that there was a gulf between him and those who believed. Again, read commentaries on Revelation, and you, you can skip a lot of these because... The Bible scholar will say, well, you know, this is the depletion of the ozone layer. This is a nuclear explosion. You know, whatever it is, the UV levels are damaging. We're heading off the scale. Again, I would say to you, rather than speculate as to how, um, just believe that he will do what he says. Right? And, and the why you are given and the response to his judgments you have, you just don't have the how which is kind of stuff you leave up to the Lord anyway, because we always like to tell him how. But he usually has different plans than we do anyway. So, verse 9 is, is a reaction that is, to me, remarkable. They know the source of their suffering. They know the cause. And rather than repent, they defy God, they blaspheme him. It's a strong word. It means to chide or to, um, to speak evil against, to mock, to rail. How do you shake your fist at a God that has taken you out? Your arms are too short to box with him. They realize he has power over these plagues and they will not repent or turn to him for help. And their response ought to... I hope lays to rest the mistaken notion that if people could just see one real act of God, they would repent. They won't. It's a spiritual battle. Remember that discussion between Abraham and the rich man and, and, and the fellow in hell. And 
He said, Abraham, send someone back to warn them. Because if someone rises from the dead, certainly they'll turn and, and go the right way. They won't have to come here. And it was Abraham who said to the rich man, no, 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 not at all true. They have Moses, they have the prophets. And even if one would raise from the dead, that won't persuade them. So here. At the end of all things, the heart that is desperately wicked is blinded still. The real problem for man is not his environment, but the condition of his heart. Sin will blind. Look at this response. And, and, and these on the earth are, are, are now getting a foretaste of hell, and their reaction says that they deserve to go there. Malachi wrote, that day of the Lord is coming, burning like an oven, and the, pride, the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. The day will come that will, they will burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. He will leave neither root or branch, but to you who fear his name, the, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And you can go out and grow fat like a stall-fed calf. You can trample down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that the Lord does this, saith the Lord of hosts. Victory for you. Judgment for them. Because God's testing does not always elicit a response of repentance. Not always. When people pass the point of no return, God continues to test them to provide a, a, an abundant witness to them of the unwillingness of their hearts. They're unwilling to hear. Revelation chapter 3, the Lord said, if you, if you keep my commandment and you persevere in this hour of trials, then I will also keep you upon, the, you who are tested upon the earth, I will keep you from the world and its judgments. Jesus in the wilderness showed who he was by the fact he endured. <laughs> the Pharaoh by the fact that he would refuse. So the remainder of these bold judgments will focus something, and, and the reason I cut them off there, not isn't so that we can have communion, obviously, but, but the rest of the bold judgments center on the, the empire of the beast. He goes after his henchmen, his city, and his rule. He, the Lord is going to destroy those who now are seeking to destroy the earth. The end will come at breakneck speed. The psalmist declared the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And the angels sing it as well. God tonight waits for you to respond to his grace. But if you will not, one day you will answer to him as judge. The cross itself is the warning of that. Sin will be judged. God suffered for your sins, so you don't have to. He died, so you don't have to. He was separated from the Father, so you don't have to. But if you refuse him, you're going to, fa you're going to face judgment. You're going to pay. Because there is a debt to be paid. Tonight, though, we can celebrate his victory. And if you're listening to us here or on, online or, or next door, God will give you victory through his son. You can go home tonight knowing your slate is clean, your sins are forgiven. There's a place for you in heaven. You'll be welcomed there. And then when we do your funeral, we'll rejoice. Oh, we'll miss you, but we'll know where you are. And you better be waiting for us. <laughs> Father, thank you tonight that you have brought us to the end of these things and oh, how hard they are to read and how difficult to imagine and yet, Lord, we certainly can't argue with the fact that you have been patient and good and waiting upon us for so long and that it is your desire to give and to bring us life. And so Father, as we sit tonight, may every person who's listening within the sound of our voice consider your son the sacrifice that he brought, the, that he endured, the, the payment that he made, the, the love that drove him, the, the, his willingness to, re, to just bring us in. And may we look to you. And if, if that's you tonight, look, if you'll pray to the Lord, Father, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Thank you for sending Jesus. I realize that he has died in my place. He's given his life for me. I owe, and yet he paid. 
And now he is willing to give me his life and the benefits of his faithfulness simply because I put my trust in him. In that simple prayer, in your transfer of your confidence from yourself to him, in, in your de declaration in faith of who he is and why he came, you're going to be given life. You're going to be saved. God is going to put his spirit into your heart. And so shall you ever be with him. He'll finish the work that tonight he begins. So if you'll pray that prayer, ask the Lord in. Have communion with us. Communion was given by God to the saints, not to the world, but to the saints that can celebrate his victory, his sacrifice. If you don't have that relationship with the Lord, communion is of no value to you. Religious exercise that can bring you nothing really but <laughs> the conviction and maybe the, the judgment of God for ignoring his son. But if you love Jesus, then we celebrate. Because when he comes for the church, when this, this age of grace is over, you've been delivered from his wrath. Jesus has completely paid the price. There is nothing left to pay. And if you prayed to receive the Lord tonight, come and talk to one of the pastors afterwards. When we dismiss, you that are online, go down to the description box at the bottom and follow the link to our page that will tell you about what it means to give your life to Christ.